Welcome everybody and introducing Powell for this um, NHSR workshop, which is an interesting R workshop because we're going to be doing Python today, but I'm going to pass you over. I'm very excited um, and just welcome everybody. Thank you for this excellent opportunity. Awesome. Hi everyone. Welcome. Uh, give me a wiggle if you can hear me, those of you who have video on. Awesome. Fantastic. Uh, good to see you here. Thanks for having me, uh, Zoe. Um, I It was amazing to meet so many of you at the NHSR Python conference. Uh, so so uh, it's good to see you all again. Uh, what we're going to do today is I'll share with you a particular bit of tech that I'm incredibly excited about, um, we'll, uh, which is the shiny, shiny apps, which you all know probably from the R world, but we're going to talk about them in Python. I'll start by introducing a tiny bit who I am. Then I'm going to describe to you the philosophy behind Shiny Apps. So those of you who've done Shiny Apps in R, uh, it will be familiar stuff. But uh, I'll, for those who, who aren't, uh, I'll, I'll talk through it uh, essentially again. Um, and then I'll show you how it's done in Python. Uh, it's a very fresh technology. They released it about half a year ago. Um, sort of officially, it left the beta. Um, and then we are going to have some exercises. So um, I've watched some of uh, Zoe's uh, perfectly edited uh, YouTube videos from other workshops, uh, and uh, they often, uh, I mean, this 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 chat, but there are some exercises as well in here towards the end. Uh, so sort of, or the second half of it uh, will be us in breakout rooms coding. So you know, if you're watching this on your phone while traveling on a on a train or uh, uh, um, you know, doing other duties, you might struggle slightly coding together, but uh, we'll wing it and it's going to be fine. So again, over the next 30 minutes, I'll be presenting and I'll be doing some sort of um, uh, theory stuff. And then we're going to move to practice. It will happen in breakout rooms. Um, in each breakout room, someone will have to share their screen and likely you'll have to share your at least your audio or audio and video just so you can see who you're working with is we're going to work in pairs or groups of three i hope that makes sense um if you haven't done this before awesome if you're going to have to wander off that's also fine uh and i think we can start now so welcome i'm going to share my screen uh this is all new interface to me but life's exciting share oh and obviously zoom vanished uh but we'll get there yeah okay i uh, you see my screen you should see a boat uh and an iceberg and i see some of your faces that's also very nice brilliant Why? so hi uh my name is pavel uh Ozhovsky, and i am a lecturer at edinburgh uni i teach in business school i also teach in medicine uh, and I also teach in literature and a few other departments. I'm essentially the person who teaches people uh, about coding, people who normally, uh, who don't come or study or work in an area where coding is their main trade. So essentially I teach coding to non-professional programmers, uh, which which is where I find myself happiest. There will be two links where we all the materials for today will be. Indeed, what I'm going to do, I'll share these two links now on the chat. But as you drop out of the chat, if it ever happens to any of you, uh, you will sort of lose that stuff. Um, but then I'll just share it again and again and again. Uh, but you don't need to access them until half an hour from now. But uh, they are on this slide, so I'm going to share them with you. Um, yeah, so uh, brace, brace. We're going to talk about Shiny. You probably know the idea of an iceberg, right? Actually, before we start, I, I will ask you to use the raise hand button, which is on your screen when I tell you. Not yet. Um, there, it's. I think it's on the bottom. It's next to mute. Is it? There's somewhere there on your screen. Uh, uh, raise hand or something like that. Um, first, let's have a hand uh, for people for who R is your first language. Like R is your main source of uh, uh, of coding in opposite to Python. So raise your hand, please, if you are an R person, and keep it up so I can count. So I know how to uh, theme this. Okay, we have three people. And now uh, drop your hand. Thank you. And now raise your hand if uh, Python is your first language. Okay, we also have three, four, five people. Okay, so we are uh, we're almost 50-50 split. Some people have neither, and that's also okay. Um, 
Awesome. So now uh, drop your hands, please. Um, and if you could, please raise your hand if you've ever used Shiny, either in R or in Python. Just so I know roughly how many people have interacted with Shiny. So raise your hand if you have used Shiny, like program Shiny, not used as a user. Uh, okay, one, two, three. Awesome, thank you. You can lower your hands now. Um, so be because it's sort of a third of the room, I'll go, go through all of the basics. Uh, and if at any point you wanna clock out, then please do. And then at the end, uh, we will do the exercises. There's some people waiting in a waiting room, so I'll admit them. Uh, okay, let's do it. Let's start with this idea of an, uh, I'll, essentially we'll use a metaphor. We'll use two metaphors to talk about Shiny Apps and the server client infrastructure, which is what Shiny Apps uh, is for. And this is the, the, the biggest strengths of that technology. We'll use the metaphor of an iceberg. And you, just, just to check in, I don't know how, when was the last time you were in high school, but essentially the, the idea with the iceberg is that there's much more of it underneath than there is on the top. That's all we need to know. And the stuff underneath is sort of secret. Like we don't actually know what shape it has. Um, and we don't have such an easy access to it. So the metaphor we'll work with is the stuff on the top that will be client side. That will be the bit that someone is interacting with in the web browser, while all of the server stuff, all of the secret things, they'll be underneath and be sort of working with this metaphor. We'll also work a little bit with metaphor of a restaurant. Like there will be kitchen, the stuff behind the scenes, and there'll be the front end. Now, uh, we'll I'll, I'll sort of talk, take you through step by step how to how we're doing these things. So even if you've already done them before or you roughly know what's going on, it sometimes is nice to hear from the top again, what is this particular bit of the process? Uh, so you probably know the exercise of people explaining you how to make a cup of tea step by step. And it surprisingly enough takes about 30 or 40 steps uh, to take a decent cup of tea. Um, if you actually start including things like open the fridge, take the milk out, close the fridge, but uh, we'll go sort of step by step. Um, the the uh, as we're going, you will encounter some errors, um, but you will have your partner. So again, you will be in breakout rooms of two or three people, uh, and I will be basically circling through all the breakout rooms. So as things are happening, you will have experience of oh something doesn't work. If something doesn't work, you can raise your hand, and me as the admin of this video call, I'll see it and I'll be able to come and help you out. Uh, I, lo I love this picture because um, I used to think that uh, I'm the hand and Python is the dog and is looking at me longingly wanting to work. But now I realize it's the other way around. Uh, Python is the hand uh, and it sort of gracefully sometimes works for me while I'm this sort of uh, longingly looking dog uh, really hoping for it to work. Over the next few uh, quarters, um, I'll introduce you to sort of ingredients of stuff and we'll talk in quite sort of separate terms about things that we need and only then we'll move to, to, to cooking bits. But before we move to cooking, we'll talk a little bit about all the things that we need. Right, I'll ask you to do another raise hand when I tell you in a second. Um, we're gonna use something called pair programming. Has any of you ever encountered pair programming, like partnering with another person where only one person has their computer on and the other person didn't? If you did that, please raise your hand, just so I know if anyone here coded with another human. Awesome. If if there's not many hands, there's one or two. Oh yeah. Um, then this is the technique we're gonna use. Essentially, you will be in small groups. And the idea is that neither of you, think about it, neither of you in the group, thank you, uh, Richita, that, that's awesome. Um, uh, neither of you have experienced this technology before, which is very likely. Some of you might not be even Python natives, which is also likely and it's also fine. So what we're gonna do will be two rubber ducks bouncing ideas off each other. And it's quite a good way to learn because quite often things that we don't know are uh, quite obvious, but we don't see that we're in a forest because we stand so close to the tree. Um, or at least that's how the Polish version of that proverb says. I'm from Poland, by the way. Um, so so we're going to work in pairs. And we we as we work, we'll bounce each other's uh, ideas off each other. And what you're going to notice is as you are asked questions and as are you asking questions, um, you will get much better at asking and answering questions. You'll become the super duck. Um, 
So when we do this uh, in person, but also when we do this online, that's roughly how it works. We would have two students and one computer, and they essentially, we might not do this in this particular workshop, but what we do in a room, we pass the keyboard around and I have this beautiful clock. I don't know if you still see my video, but every 15 minutes it beeps and we essentially switch who's typing. Uh, but what we're going to do instead here, you'll be in breakout rooms and it's sort of going to be up to you how you're working through the materials. I'll be there to help you. So this is the idea of pair programming, just to finish this section before we move to the actual shiny. There's normally a person who types um, and talks about what they're typing while the other person is the, oh, this is our clue to change who's driving. Um, there's the person who types and then there's a the person who's listening and is navigating. So this the, the other person is their, like their companion. And then every now and then they essentially switch who's driving. And as you can imagine, when you're learning something completely, completely new, it's actually quite nice uh, to have someone to bounce your ideas off. And the navigator is usually the person who notices a missing bracket or something like that. And then essentially they go and change who's driving. And that's how typical uh, programming setup looks like. That's how it looks like in the industry where I work, uh, where I'm a mobile developer, but also that's how it works in academia. Right, that's it about the introduction. Uh, I think we can move to Shiny. I hope uh, uh, you can understand what I'm talking. I'm aware that my accent is, 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 is my accent. And also I know that I talk very quickly. So if at any point uh, you can't hear me or something makes no sense, then please just talk in the chat. Um, and welcome to the new people, uh, by the way, thanks for having videos. It's always nice to teach to, uh, people who I can see your smiling faces or confused faces rather than a bunch of gray squares. So, um, by the way, if you ever want to do something nice for an online presenter, switch on your video, they will love you forever. Right. So we're back to the metaphor of an iceberg. What are we going to have? Uh, uh, you know, when, when you think about the iceberg, there's obviously the bit on the top and there's the bit on the bottom, the bit we don't understand, the bit we don't know. We don't actually know exactly what shape it is. We don't exactly know how big it is. Probably someone from physics would tell us, oh, no, it's exactly 0 0.78, whatever um, size of the top, but we don't actually know. And it's going to, it's really, really interesting, this boundary here. You see this line, uh, which separates the top, the sort of the front uh, end uh, to the back and front and back end are two terms that you hear probably quite a lot um, when talking about software. Front end is the bit that we see, back end is the thing, the secret bit that we don't see. And we're gonna talk about how do we safely and securely and privately close this boundary. You know, we'll we'll talk about building software where a user or a patient or a client can see the stuff on top. Um but the, the the app, the dashboard, whatever, it has access to the stuff uh, on the bottom, but it's only the dashboard, it's not the client. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. We can use this metaphor of a very, very silly uh, app, a uh, very, very silly dashboard, like the simplest possible thing I could think of. So let's imagine we have a wee slider. Uh, this is slider, you know, slider, it moves right and left. It can take a value between zero and a hundred. So I could grab this dot, uh, and move it around. So if I move it to the right and stop it in the middle, it will say 50. And then in this dashboard, we have another, uh, so this is input, right? Where I'm inputting some information. Then on the right, uh, let's imagine that we have some output, right? Input, I'm talk putting something into the computer and output, I'm taking something out of the computer. Indeed, it's gonna tell me, for example, oh, you picked 20, so N is 20 and you pick 20, so N, n times 2 is 40, which makes sense. So visualize it. If I move it to 50, that's going to suddenly instantly change into n times 2 is 100. Because this made to 50, this becomes 100. So far, so good. I know it's a very simple metaphor, and it doesn't really uh, yet click why even we're we doing this. But this is very simple logic, right? Like multiplying times 2, it's not the, you know uh, computer science. Uh, but it gets really interesting where the processing, so turning that 20 into that 40, when this, this thing, it's much more complicated than just multiplying by two. It gets much more interesting where in our dashboard, I need to ask sort of a brain behind the operation or a cloud. Uh, I really like this icon because it's both brain and the cloud. Um, when I'm doing something, for example, I logged in or I'm choosing a different hospital department to see information about, so this doesn't have to be a slider. This could be a drop down or something. Um, 
when I'm doing something in the input and it has to go behind the scenes to the cloud, to the brain, to the sort of hidden secret back end uh, element. Whoop. Uh, and only then it can give me the output. I hope you understand this, this distinction. If the logic has to happen in a secret place where we don't want the user to know. So why we wouldn't want the user to know? Because for example, I'm choosing a, a hospital department in my dashboard. It goes to the database where it knows how many patients there are. And it tells me, oh, there's 130 patients there, right? I make a choice. It asks behind the scenes. It shows me the result. So obviously you don't want the user to know exactly who these patients are. You want the, the sort of the stuff behind the scene to be secret, but you want them to be able to choose from a dropdown and see a sort of, you know, anonymized collected uh, output. And this is where it becomes interesting. So the stuff on the top we call client side, you know, because client is the person using it on their on the web browser, person using the dashboard. Uh, sometimes that's called front end. And the stuff in the background, that's called server side, back end. It comes from the days where you actually had a computer running in your basement. Uh, which was the server. It was sort of computer on which your data lived. Uh, but these days it's all happening on the cloud, but we still call it server side. Uh, just like a floppy disk is still an icon for saving things. While, you know, no one have ever seen a, a floppy disk for a few decades now. Um, but this is sort of, this is, this is, this is what we're looking at. Breathe in, breathe out. You probably realize that I talk very, very quickly. Um, so the next metaphor we're going to work with, and this is where we're going to start intermingling some of the Python code, um, is the idea of a restaurant. Have you ever been in a restaurant where you see them cooking? Uh, I really, really like restaurants where you see them cooking. Essentially, you're sitting there. It happens a lot in sushi places, but also um, in, in um, it, you know, it's not limited to just cutting fish. Uh, but the idea is that you're sitting there and you see them cook stuff. Um, so let's think, let's immerse ourselves a little bit in a human experience of being in a restaurant. You know, we're going to talk about this user interface, right? So by user, we mean the person who came to the restaurant. Think about it. The two things that happen to you, the two activities, the two things the restaurant really needs to provide you essentially is the list of options, right? I come there and goes like, oh, this is, this is the coffee options or this is the lunch options. And then they need to, I need to be able to make my choices as, as the you know, as the visitor, as the client of the restaurant. So I see the menu, I tell the waiter person, uh, oh, I want this particular thing. Then something magical happens and it appears on my table, right? Like this is this is the sort of, the magical bit obviously is what we're going to focus on in a minute. But before we get there, I want us to really embrace what's going on here. So if this was a dashboard, let's go back to say hospital and choosing the department. And we want to know how many beds are occupied. Um, I want to be able to view the options, you know, so somewhere somehow will have to tell me, oh, these are the departments I can choose from. I can go on oh, neurology. Um, and then I need uh, some sort of way, some sort of interface to make my choices. By the way, the word interface, it means a way to communicate. Like I can interface with you a little bit right now uh, by I asked you to raise a hand earlier and that's interaction, that's interface. So. I want to see the options and then I want to be able to choose one of the options and then some magic ha will happen behind the scenes and then I'll see the number, like, oh, there's 130 people in that particular department. So, you know, uh, the, the sort of, we're gonna try to narrow down like really our scopes on where this magic happens. So I gave my order to the waiter and the waiter's gonna go and give it to the restaurant staff. Uh, I don't know how many of you've ever worked in a restaurant, I, I did for quite a few years uh, in my earlier life. But essentially what happens when a waiter delivers the order to the kitchen people, kitchen people have this big sort of, uh, someone like for lying, blah, blah, I can English, it's almost like a clip for drying laundry, you know? So the kitchen people, so this is a cook, they will sort of pin the orders that are coming to this sort of um, big long peg, essentially. And it will say in here, oh, they want uh, fish and chips, and it's for table number five. So this is this is this is where the order is continuing its journey. They might have written it on a piece of paper, and that piece of paper gets sort of clipped. And then a person in the in the kitchen, so a cook, is picking up this piece of paper. So there's this exchange of a waiter is giving the order, and the order is picked up by the cooks, right? So this is 
uh, don't worry, it's not a cooking class. It is actually going to be about shiny. So um, what happens when the, we have this person who cooks, and this is the server, spoiler alert. This is the, the this is your Python code that will be processing your data. And it's also your Python code that knows the logic following which you want the data to be processed. So this sort of the server side, the, the bit of your code that's handling it is going to have access to the data, just like they would have access to ingredients in a restaurant. And they're going to have access to the logic you know, logic like process, uh, loops and if statements and all that. Um, but it, if this was a restaurant, that would be a recipe uh, or a seep, you know, essentially where, where they know what to cook and how. What's really interesting here is it's only the server, it's only the cook that would, should have access to ingredients and the recipe. Like it shouldn't be that a client who wants a little bit more jalapeno on their nachos walks into the kitchen, bypasses all the cooks, grabs a little jalapeno from the little bowl and puts it on their plate. That's just not hygienic, right? That just would not work in a restaurant setup. Instead, it's only the cooks who can get these requests and who can return the results. Do you see what I'm saying? So this is quite cool because this is what we're focusing here. This sort of server side, the bit where the logic happens and it happens in a little bit secret, in a little bit constrained and private space. But from the point of view of the person in the restaurant, they handed in their order and they received their plate. So that's that's sort of what we're going to look at, but in code in a minute. Um, you know what? I'm going to come back to these uh, to these slides in a second because there's this text in them. Um, but so before before we go, um, there's one more tiny important detail, and it's very easy to forget about this detail. Is this table five? I ordered and I was sitting at table five. They got my order and they knew that it was for table five. They went off and cooked it, and it arrives at table five. I know it's a bit obvious, but you know, in in software, you start really boiling down the computer science detail of how things talk to each other. This this table five, the 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 referencing, like how do I know? that I bring the food to the table that ordered it. This is literally the core concept, especially in Shiny. Um, so, so, you know, clock in on this little bit um, and I'm gonna show you how the Python code's gonna look like. I just realized yesterday giving this talk in a big auditorium that the font is tiny. So uh, I hope you're gonna be able to read the font or maybe increase it somehow on your screen. Um, but let's go back to our, our metaphor here. Uh, this is not going to be the hospital department. It's going to be the slider and the output. And because uh, sometimes uh, my metaphors fail me and I couldn't come up with anything better, let's imagine that the slider is the investment. Say I'm investing 20, I don't know, pounds. Um, and because it's not a real world, I'm actually earning twice as much. So I have a slider for investment and I'm earning twice as much, right? This is going to be the flow. But the, the actual process of multiplying is going to happen on the server. See this word investment, and this was earnings. This is going to be the table five business. So each slider, each input, and each output, like this little text field, it all needs an ID, you know, a unique identifier. So we need a way to reference what is the slider because you know you might end up having many, many drop downs on your dashboard or many, many sliders. So each of them needs a unique. ID, unique identifier, the way we talk about them. Same with outputs. So how we do it in Python, in Shiny, there is essentially sort of a collections of them, a collection of them, uh, that's how I think about it, called input. So I can go input.investment, and notice that I'm calling this as if this was a function. There's a open and close round bracket behind the word investment. And if I call this function, right, if I go input.investment function, it will return me 20. So this is, it's it's quite cool the way they solved it in Python here uh, in Shiny. Like you have a collection of all your inputs. Say we have investment and we have hospital department and we have, I don't know, uh, country. Um, so you would have to go input dot hospital department or input dot country. And as long as this word investment is spelled exactly like this name of the function here, uh, it's going to return you whatever the value is. So if this was a slider, it would return you number 20. If this was uh, you know, a dropdown, it would return you whatever is in that dropdown. And this is quite cool. Notice you did not have to write this function. We never had to define a function investment. Instead, it sort of just happens automatically. 
as long as you have input with this name, you have access to requesting what is in there. The other way though, so if I want to produce some output, I want to show something in this field and say the ID of this text field is earnings, what I need to do is to define a function called earnings. And again, the name of this ID and name of this function have to be the same. And whatever this, this function returns, it's going to show up here in this text field. So if I created an, a function that returns a string, like a word, say banana, then I would see here the word banana. Um, I really like the word banana in programming because banana is the most ridiculous thing you can think of. And I can't visualize a code which should return banana. So if you see banana, it means it's a placeholder. Yeah. So if I define earnings, this is the ID, this is the function, it works. I know I'm, I've just said it seven times, but that's how it works. And this is the actual code that makes it run. Um, I'll leave it on the screen just for a second. For those of you who are not uh, Pythoners, um, I'll explain in a tiny bit. Essentially, I'm defining a function earnings, right? So this function. So the function that will define me what shows up in the text field. And then the function returns a string. F string, if you've never seen them, notice it's it's a letter F just before open quotes. The quotes end here. So everything inside these quotes with an F in front uh, is going to be a fast string uh, or formatted string, essentially. The F is a bit weird, but it's one of the Python thingies. They just did not want to introduce another quote, uh, like JavaScript introduced another type of quote, but at some point you run out of keyboard and you have no more types of quotes. So essentially anything inside of here becomes a string. And I'm saying n times two is, notice it's exactly like in here in my output. And then I'm inputting variable uh, or an operation to input a variable into sort of fast string if you haven't seen them before, you surround them with curly brackets because we still had some brackets left to play with. And uh, I would say input.investment, you recognize it from here, input.investment times two. And this is actual Python code It's going to get evaluated. So it knows that input.investment is a number. It knows that if I multiply it times two, the number becomes twice as large. So this function essentially, this is, this is the code that makes this thing on top happen. Does that make sense? So it's very, very simple example, but as we go over next, uh, you know, hour and a bit, I can't remember how much time we have. Um, you know, we that's what we're gonna work on. We essentially gonna uh, look at very, very simple examples of bunch of inputs where we can program outputs. So they use the inputs to do their thing. And we'll work a little bit with, with some edge cases. There's also something called decorators. And these, I can't remember if Shiny uh, R has them, uh, but I, I see some nodding heads. Essentially, before you define your function, you can uh, add these at blah, 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 decorators. They're not really Python code, like the name decorator suggests. Uh, I mean, you know, the holidays are coming, so people are decorating their houses with light bulbs and whatnot. But the decorator is just sort of for the Python to know for sure, for sure what's happening. So uh, I'm saying, oh, it's an at output, which means this function will be connected with some output. And also I can say, oh, by the way, render it as text. If you don't know the word render, render means to um, uh, visualize. Uh, render means to, to take some, some math or some string or some text or something and make it sort of pretty. Um, so what we're saying here, whatever we return from the function, it should be rendered, it should be prettified as text. Uh, there's also render.table, which you would imagine what it's for. Like, you know, if I return some tabular data, it's going to show it in a beautiful table. I can also render it as a graph or, or uh, sort of some sort of visualization. It's very, very cool as we go through the examples today, but also as you go through them later, because I'll give you a lot of homework. I'll give you a lot of stuff to play with later. Um, you will see that there's a bunch of different ways you can render uh, information. Uh, so before we move to the first exercise, um, I hope this made sense. Think about it. If you have any questions, there's a uh, write them in a text and ask you thinking and writing your questions before we move to exercises. I'll go back to this slide where it's going to be a little bit of text uh, and I'll explain some, some details and sort of the reasons why we would even uh, use this technology. Um, so again, there's two columns here we're talking about. On the left, we have the client side. So the, the, the in restaurant terms, the waiters and, and front people are called front of the house stuff. So there's the client side, the front end. And on the right column, we have the server side. This is the kitchen people, uh, you know, the back end. 
On the left, we call that user interface or client. You and you see it in your web browser, just like you would see um, your your Gmail or your Outlook or you know any other app that you access through your web browser on the internet. It has this user interface. You probably used even if you haven't built shiny dashboards, you have used them in the past. So essentially, this is the bit that you have access to, and the high, the stuff behind the scenes that you don't see. That's a server. Uh, what you see on user interface, it's inputs and outputs, essentially buttons, sliders, drop downs, that type of stuff as inputs, and text and tables and graphs as the output. Well, on the server stuff, it, like we've seen on the re restaurant metaphor, that's the logic, the computation, the data. You could co connect to the files with data, or you connect to an API, you know, like an online source of data. Um, and because it's hidden, because it's secret, it's actually quite safe, and you know you can you can have your details for connecting to the database there, and um, no one's gonna uh, see them. Um, and again, where do I interact with it? Uh, to, with the client side, I interact in my web browser, and for the server side, um, I don't actually interact with the server as a human, as a user. It's the browser that will interact with it behind the scenes. Um, in terms of access, the client side is essentially public. When you think about it, someone might need to log in to see a bit more, but in its essence, it's public in a way that uh, you know you go to the Facebook website and you see something, you see blue colors and probably adverts being thrown at you, but uh, only once you log in, you see a little bit more, but in its essence, it's public. While server in its essence is internal, it's secret. In terms of data on the client side, once you're logged in and using it, you only see the selective ones. So in our example of a hospital department, I only see that there's 130 humans in there. Um, you know, So I can add extra layers of security, extra layers of privacy, um, and extra layers of focus. Like it's much easier to see 130 as a number rather than a list of names that I have to count manually or something. While on the server side, that th all the things are there. Finally, in terms of how we're building it, uh, you'll be happy to hear that we're not going to have to learn HTML, uh, which is a wonderful language, but not today, not today. Um, we're going to write the front end in Python, like you've seen in that example of investment and um, earnings. And we're going to write it in Python, but for the purposes of your browser, it's going to be translated into HTML, which means that your browser actually knows what to do with it. Um, and then in terms of server, it's going to be also written in Python uh, or in R if you're using R. And that's essentially how it's going to work. I hope that's going to make sense. So we slowly, let me see the chat. Let me defeat it by Zoom here a little bit. Awesome. OK, uh, if there are no questions now, don't worry. There'll be plenty of time to ask them later. Um, what we're going to do now, I we I will so I'll explain what's happening so that you know when it happened that you're not surprised. Um, we're gonna be coding in groups, but first I'll show you exactly what is it that we're gonna be coding uh, in or about. Uh, and I see the link doesn't work. Do I need to add HTTPS before it? Yeah, now the link works. So I'm sharing here my screen. I'm opening the link that I sent you, and I'll very roughly talk you through it so that when you're in your pairs and it's time for you to code, you roughly know what's going on. So uh, let's look at this very simple example. So what, what's, what the link will take you to is a website with a bunch of links. Surprise, surprise. Each of these links, it's sort of harder and harder example of different things you can do in Shiny. Uh, and these are sort of different links that I prepared for you. Uh, earlier, but this is, for example, the the actual bit of code that we've written together. Um, I've done something wrong here, so I don't. Uh, we don't actually see the editor. Do I need to go editor. Amazing, awesome. I'm sending you thereby a new link. Let's see if it works. So this is going to be the first example. By the way, you will see that the link. Actually, if you if you open your chat, check out this link. What do you see? Do you see a gigantic pile of gibberish? Um, do you know what a zip file is? You know, when you when you compress some files for them to get smaller, this is the code that I've written, but zipped. So this is quite cool about these this prototyping environment that we're gonna see uh, in here. 
uh, is this is prototyping environment for writing Shiny. So again, you wouldn't send this to a client. Uh, instead, this is for us to, it's a playground. It's for us to play around. And it has these, these components. See that the link was the code. So when you click the link, you will already see the code I've written. And the sections of the screen, let me just uh, go away. I'll shrink this a little bit. Uh, if the font is too small, then please raise your hand. Otherwise, if you can see it and if you can read it, then we'll just continue. So notice this is exactly the code I showed you on a slide. Take just a few seconds to look at it. In a minute, you'll be able to look at it with your partners. But essentially on the left, you see the code. On the right, you see a running Shiny app. If you make any changes in the code, it will automatically get updated there. So here on the top, you know, I'm creating a UI page fluid. Fluid means uh, it's responsive. It means if I'm looking at this on a mobile phone, actually there's not nothing we can see here. It just means it stretches nicely and prettily uh, as I move it around. And on this page, I have two items. I have the slider and I have the output text, which is this, this thingy here. By the way, if you're not a native speaker like me, I had to Google the word verbatim. Verbatim means word by word, like it's exactly repeated. Um, so there's few things here in the slider when you're looking at it. Let's let's actually uh, change it a wee bit. Banana. So there's a play button here in the middle, which is sort of going to uh, update it. So look, the second string is the hint, is the word that the user is going to see. So this could be, I don't know, the department for, the, for, for hospital if this was drop down. This is the minimum, this is the maximum, and this is the default value. Just like a slider, to have a slider, we actually need to give it these three values. If I make the default value 50 and refresh, then that's 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 how it changes. Now, this first thingy here, this string, this is the ID. Remember the table five? This is the this is the, the unique name that I'm giving to this slider. I called it N. Terrible name. Uh, I should call it something like slider, slider, or actually department or investment. Right. But then notice this when I'm using it as an input, I have to go input.investment. So again, the word we're using for uh, the ID of the slider, it has to be the same as uh, when I'm accessing sort of the inputs of the slider. Indeed, the interface, this coding interface is going to be kind enough to highlight it. When I select one, it's going to sort of select another. Now, the other thing we're seeing is this here n times two is 100. Well, it works. Um, and again, I'm going to give it some sort of ID. And notice I called it TXT. Again, terrible variable name. Uh, so let's call it something better, like earnings. But then I need to remember to rename also this function that was sort of going to tell us what to put in there. So again, if the function earnings, instead of returning, uh, instead of returning what it's returning, if it returned the word banana, and I refresh, then it's going to show me the word banana. But that's obviously nonsense. So instead, let's show us the string that says, oh, n times 2 is, and then the result of this particular simple uh, math operation. There's the decorators that you've seen before. Indeed, I think as we're typing, yes, as we're typing, and you know, I said render dot, it's going to suggest me all the possible things I could do, just like any other decent um, coding environment. So, you know, this is a this is a coding environment and it does everything that coding environment needs to do. Um, because, and I think that's it. Essentially, you create your page, you define your server function. So not the server means uh, it's 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 sort of this this is once you deploy it, once you properly deploy it into the cloud, everything in this function will be secret and everything in this function will be usable visible to the user. Um, we're not going to go through deploying it properly to the Shiny servers today, but uh, I can follow up with you all and send you a particular tutorial where they very, very well explain how to do it. Um, it's just depending on what computer you have and what security settings you have, it would take um, a lot of time to, to make sure everyone's there. But the company who makes Shiny for Python, they have very, very good um tutorials on how to do it. And then the last step here, notice what this uh, this is doing. I'm creating a variable called app. 
and I'm running a function, and this is sort of the core of Shiny. This is the bit that connects. Uh, uh, this is the bit that connects the AI, the UI, which is the top bit, and the server function, which is this bit. So essentially, this is the 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 conductor who will play the whole orchestra, who's going to make it happen, right? So this was an example of uh, what was there. I'll show you an example of another one. As you click these. They will open in your web browser. And again, you will see the three components. You will see the, um, the, the, the code. You will see the, the user interface code. You will see the server code. And it's going to be your job with your partner to understand what's going on. And there will be sort of tasks for you. Um, I'm, I have my full trust uh, in you all that you will figure out how to do it. Uh, and if you want, then raise your hand and I'm going to come and help you out here on the bottom. So this section here on the bottom, that's your output. It's your sort of a, a terminal. It's it's where uh, if you print something, right? If here I go print, you already guess what I'm going to print, right? Print banana. And I run it. Um, then here is what I where I see whatever I print. It's useful for debugging and wherever you get lost. So as we go, have a look at what all of these bits of code do. And with your partner, can I undo? Yeah, and with your partner, essentially, we'll, we'll work you through it. I'm not going to open them all. Instead, I'll tell you what they are. Higher lower is a very simple game where a computer has a secret number and you have to guess it moving the slider. And it will tell you, no, no, a bit higher. No, no, a bit lower. Next one is showing you example of how you would use drop downs for again for a very simple game where a person chooses something another person chooses something and there's a secret logic which again happening on a server who figures out who wins essentially it's a paper scissors stone but you don't know the logic behind them the next one shows you a graph with the local file and that's quite the interesting one because in the shiny you can actually upload a particular file there's a plus uh, add an empty file and there's an upload find section there. So you can include your data there just like you could include them in your server, which again, makes it a very powerful prototyping environment. Uh, we're not gonna, go, not gonna go through this very much uh, today, but these buttons are very, very useful in this programming interface. You can save whatever you're working on uh, on your computer and you can load them from your computer. So this is one of the smart usages of ability of your web browser to interact with your file system, so interact with your hard drive. There's also a share, which is very, very useful, where you can share with someone a link to your prototype, to the to the thing that you're building. Um, so that's the example where we have some, some sliders, and it updates the little table graph underneath that just shows some part of the data. Uh, I think this is uh, deaths in Scotland uh, in NHS. It's part of the open data sets. Um, that uh, Scottish NHS gives you. So again, you will have a look with your partner on how it looks. You will see that this is already starting to use pandas. So it's starting to use uh, essentially the the more advanced data science-y things in Python. For those of you who are not Python people, uh, pandas, so this whole data frame thing is essentially Python people really wanting to be like R, being very envious of R and they sort of recreated R and called it pandas, uh, bless their heart. Um, so then another example is where instead of including this gigantic file there, we load the file from, from a place on the internet. So, you know, so I actually hosted that exact file, same file there, but it means that we, um, we load it so that our, our, our actual shiny is much, much smaller. Uh, instead it sort of fetches its data when it needs them, but there's all sorts of intricate things that need to happen when you do that type of stuff. Uh, then there is an exercise where uh, we've built a very simple drawing interface. And I'm going to have to shrink the font for this, will I? Yes. So we can move the we dot by moving the X and Y slider, and we sort of see the dot moving. I know it's a very, very silly example, and you can add a dot by press of a button, but it shows you how uh, you can change the graphs and also gather data by using interface components and using a button, which when you think about it, it's quite a specific uh, way to interact with stuff. Um, and then there's there's another one where it's just a bigger example of using graphs. So again, I, this is silly. Am I sharing my screen? 
Oof, I thought I'm not sharing my screen. That would be disastrous. Um, right, so this is what we're gonna do. I hope this makes sense. I've sent you the link to this particular website with, with links. I'll put you now in pairs of three in breakout rooms. Uh, if you're here, but actually you, you just wanted to watch some slides and uh, you don't actually have mental space, energy or attention uh, to follow on, um, then either sort of piggyback. But if we have a breakout room with three people and all of them just want to watch, then that will become problematic. Um, so what are we going to do? Well, I'll put you in a pairs. Uh, the way it works best, if one of you um, gets vol volunteer tears themselves or otherwise uh you know i'll volunteer you um so to share your screen how it's going to go one of you uh is going to have to share your screen and start working through this while others will become your navigators so other people in the room will be able to work with you and guide you if you're so inclined which i do recommend after you finished working through the first uh through the through the higher lower example i recommend that you change who is the driver, who is the person sharing their screen. Don't worry, I'll be going through the breakout rooms. So if at any point it's anyone's confused uh, outcome. I think Zoom works in a way that if you raise your hand in a breakout room, I'll see it. Um, if it doesn't work this way, we'll wing it. We'll figure this out. Right, I hope that makes sense. Um, are you all, you all understanding what we're gonna do now? Please raise your hand if you if you, or thumb up uh, if if you know what's going on. Um, if you're in a breakout room and it looks like you're the only person who's actually online, oh, I think we're not going to have this problem. Thank you for all the raised hands. Um, then then essentially uh, call me over and we'll figure this out. The link is there, um, and it's the Dr. Pavel GitHub IO uh, link. So uh, open it and some tab and some of your computer. Uh, and uh, this is me. Um, I'm going to stop sharing now. And now I'm going to start looking for the button to create breakout rooms. Do, 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 do. Breakout rooms, such joy. So how many there are of us? One, two, three, four, eight, 12, 16. There's 16 people. Um, I'm going to create five breakout rooms. Right, so that will put three-ish people in each. I think that's gonna work out. Uh, three, four participants per room. Uh, I'm gonna create it now. So once you're in a breakout room, you know, switch on your videos and 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 microphones and agree who's gonna be the first uh, uh, driver, who's gonna try to share your screen. Be mindful that maybe your computer is your NHS work computer and it actually doesn't allow you to share your screen. In which case, just try the next person over. Uh, if that also doesn't work, I'll come over and help you out because, uh, you know, hacking is the way forward. I'm looking forward to seeing you all in your breakout rooms. I hope you will enjoy looking at them, even if with your partner, you make your way through one or even two examples, but you actually immerse yourself in what it is and how it works, and you'll be able to continue this journey later. That's also great. This is designed as a very, very first sort of like a taster session to stay in the restaurant. Uh, metaphor it's a smogger's board um we have so many swedish restaurants in edinburgh for some magical reason uh, and uh, yay um but you know they give you this tasting platter of little bit of gherkins and whatnot um so this this course again this 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 session is designed as a tasting platter so hopefully even if you just get a little bit out of it that's already brilliant right so in about 10 seconds i'll press the button i'll put you in the breakout rooms you roughly know what to do but in any case call me over and I'll be circling around. Uh, good luck. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what you come up with. If you lose the link, just ask me and I'll paste again. Right, see you in your breakout rooms. Why? Uh, and in terms of ending, oh, we sorry, go on. Um, the, I think we scheduled until 12. I'm aware that people have lives uh, and whatnot. Um, I will be circling through the room. So I'll see you a number of number of times, but we'll absolutely for sure, for sure end um, I say 45 past 11. So 45 past 11, um, uh, I will bring everyone back into the main room. But if you have to leave earlier than that, go for it. But we'll bring everyone to the main room and we'll have a little bit of Q&A. Of Q but also if you have questions, just ask them as I'm visiting your room. 
Um, awesome. Good luck. What was meant to be easy? It's giving me a million options now. Sorry. Uh, right. Open all rooms. Bonk. This meeting is being recorded. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. I think slowly we'll start trickling in to the main room. Welcome back, everyone. Um, we're going to do a tiny bit of debrief at the end. I think we still have some people hiding in the breakout rooms. Uh, but I think, yeah, they'll, they'll have to close the button. Do, 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 do. Right. So welcome back. Uh, we did work through, I've seen some groups uh, work through most of the examples. Some worked quite in depth, but through one or two only, and that's totally okay. Um, uh, so what we're going to do now is we're going to do a tiny bit of debrief. Uh, what you learned, how was the experience, and I'll point you roughly at what should be the next steps um, of, of, of continuing this adventure, so you just to accept it. Um, Right. H how was it? Uh, essentially, this is me opening it uh, to you. This was for many of you new in more than one way. There was new coding environment. There was new language. There was a new paradigm. I mean, this idea of server client and the way that bits of code talk to each other. That was quite new. Um, what would be interesting if you all either uh, switch on your uh, microphone and tell me, or even type in the chat, um, what did you learn? What were your favorite things that you didn't know, you know, two hours ago, and now you know them? Uh, what, what's, what's new for you? What was fun? Oh, yeah. I've I've had you in groups share some really really cool stuff. So, but if you if you don't if you don't feel like uh, um, uh, sharing on a microphone, just type it in the chat. So someone's talking about pair programming. Um, yes, I absolutely love it. I teach using this technique for about six years now. I sat down recently and calculated about one and a half thousand students worked with me this way. But it's it's a very very traditional way to code in programming companies. That's just how we code in the industry. So I make mobile games uh, and mobile apps a part of my academic world. So that's that's quite cool. Uh, the nice thing is you you all you need is another person, and it's quite nice, especially when you start changing and switching. And it's surprisingly useful um, where you both learning. Like, you know, sometimes we think, oh, to work with someone, they should be sort of more like a mentor, like a teacher. While what we see here, it's you can be just the same fresh to this topic. And yet there's something nice and working together. Uh, someone's saying about interactive programming. So this type of it's both interacting with other humans, but also interactive where you write the code and you immediately see what's going on. So this this interface is quite lovely. I, I really like how how it works. And it means that you very quickly find the mistakes and can um, move on. Someone's writing about the interactive part of Shiny Python. It was interesting and bouncing ideas, uh, working with the team. That's quite nice. I'm really uh, happy uh, that you had this experience. Um, I know that within the uh, NHSR community, there is this like a code clinic. I think once a month, uh, um, people come and, and work on their code. But next time you go to one of those, consider doing exactly that. Just hop into a breakout room with someone talk them through your code or through your adventure or through your project and get them to talk with you because it's quite a nice way to uh, to learn and learn as a community because this is what we're doing here, right? We're optimizing for everyone to learn as much as possible rather than one person getting it and everyone else sort of looking. Um, so that's nice. Someone saying about the safe environment to explore without a risk of breaking anything. Yes, that is lovely. Uh, that's, why I, that's why I teach using this shiny prototyping environment it's quite nice it means that you can do some experiments but also when you're working on your you know actual shiny for work and you're thinking like but how would this work if i have two buttons and they do blah you can very quickly spin up um a prototype like an experiment 
experiment in the safe space and then bring it over, which is which is quite nice. Uh, Shiny apps written in Python like they are in R, that is really, really cool. Like I was so joyful when 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 this uh, entered the market in March uh, this year. Um, within two weeks, I taught a university course in it. So it was quite a break your neck, a run down the hill adventure, but it was worth it. So now we slowly have the whole uh, group in, in Edinburgh Uni where I teach. Um, we have a whole group of medicine people uh, entering data science already with this skill. Uh, the guess, the number game where they, they can reduce the probability from 100 to 1 uh, to a certainty through coding. Yes, that's that's quite cool. It's quite funny how, I'm reading the chat, by the way. Uh, it's quite funny how the simplest thing can become a game. And I know I know you've seen it and it can be quite joyful, like, you know, paper, scissors, stone, higher, lower, um, guess the card, you know, all of these things, they, they are, they're, sort of silly examples of code, but it's always much more fun where you gamify what you're working on. So I'm happy you had this experience. As you can tell, I really, really like it. I uh, didn't know you can code Shiny apps using Python on a cloud server. Yes, that's really cool. Notice some of you were saying, oh, but I don't actually have Python installed on my machine because you didn't have to. It just happens in the web browser, which is magical, right? Uh, and this is a whole new technology that you might see and hear about. It's called WebAssembly. A web like the website and assembly like assembly is the zero zero one 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 zero zero one the sort of ancient programming language where you talk in zeros and ones and just sort of happens so essentially now the modern browsers have a built-in ability to run a tiny simple computer in the browser computer philosophically speaking so essentially you have your browser can run python if that makes sense if it's assembled if it's crunched and squished and prepared in a certain way um so that's quite cool. Um, what I did not teach you is how now you would take this experimental Shiny and release it in a place where it's actually the server is super secure and invisible and the client is visible. But this would be the next step. So if you choose to continue on this adventure, have a look at the Shiny website. And indeed, uh, right now, before we finish, in, can I share a file in a chat? Here's an idea. Uh, screenshot, no, file. So I'm sharing the notes uh, from this, uh, so the, the, the slides. Uh, you should be able to download them uh, into your computer. And in these notes, you have links. So you have two links, essentially, on the very first slide. One link is to whatever we were interacting, you know, the website with five links, which, oh, this is the higher, lower, this is the drawing interface, blah, blah. Another link is absolutely brilliant tutorial that the shiny Python people made. It's masterclass in how to teach. It's awesome. Um, so, so that's uh, you know, download this file so you have it for later, um, and and have a wee look. If uh, your computer for 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 some limitation reasons cannot download files, I'll share these two links here, um, just on the chat, just so you see them for later. So this is the tutorials. Um, that uh, that are prepared for the shiny team, and this is the links to the exercises that we worked through today. Uh, and there's one more. Uh, and the side by side compiler is great to looking at how the code writing affects what you produce. Yes, this is brilliant. So I again, my background is mobile development, like I build apps and games for mobile phones. So I always have a little simulator of a phone or even my phone, you know, glued to the screen with a with a clip. So this is how I grew up coding, if that makes sense. And I'm really happy I could share this experience with you. Um, so these interfaces do exist. They're quite nice. Uh, they sometimes get quite slow when when you're building is, is you know, complicated. There's big data sets and whatnot, but it's quite nice. Um, but one thing that you have seen, and hopefully this is going to be a transferable meta skill uh, that you all acquired here, coding without seeing what's going on is a bad idea. Like your code at any given point should work, right? If you don't know what the output should be, put the word banana in there. So it works and you see the word banana. You know, you want it to work at all times. Um, if, if there's a bit of code that's still uncertain, comment it out. It's control question mark in Python or command question mark on a Mac. You know, so always try to work towards being able to see stuff. And if there are moments like when you don't see stuff, like it's errored out, try to minimize these, these, er these, these sort of error things. Thank you all for coming. This was absolutely lovely. Uh, um, 
I know there's more of these workshops and Zoe and the team are organizing them. Um, so, you know, keep attending them, come to the coding clinic and do introduce pair programming into your coding clinic. Um, if there's other workshops that you would like to see or continue working on it, I think we're all on the NHS Python R, NHS R Slack. So you can find me there as well. Keep going. Thank you for coming. Lovely to meet you all. Uh, and yeah, uh, at the latest, see you at the next year's conference. Um, but hopefully see you all a little bit sooner. Yay, brilliant. Uh, oh yeah, and for those of you who are using LinkedIn, uh, somehow I, I'm finding LinkedIn is the easiest interface to connect uh, between academia and not academia. I'm gonna send my LinkedIn link here so you can uh, uh, befriend me, whatever it's called these days, but also so we can keep updating each other. I usually publish notes like the ones you just experienced on the Creative Commons, which means that they're sort of open source and it means anyone can go and teach this workshop by themselves elsewhere. So if you want to do something similar with your colleagues or do it by yourself or invite me over, uh, I'm open to that. Awesome. I think we're run, uh, running out of time and I'm starving. I skipped breakfast this morning because I was silly. Um, so thank you for being here. Absolutely lovely. <laughs> Brilliant. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. I'll stop recording now. Stop it. Right. Hey, thanks so much.